Welcome to Around the Weird. Here's your host, the museum curator of the strange and unusual, Mr. Nothing. Thank you, mysterious voice, and welcome back to Around the Weird, a booktube channel where I talk about all the unusual and out-of-the-ordinary literature that I have found in my travels. Today, I want to talk about a book that I read, one that is about um, a fight between a, uh, a railroad and a group of ranchers. I am referring to The Octopus, A Story of California by Frank Norris. For those who don't know, Frank Norris, or otherwise known as Benjamin Norris, his birth name, he was uh, an author who lived between uh, eight, the 1870s and uh, 1903 when he died from uh, appendicitis, I believe it was, unfortunately. So in that time, he wrote a, a couple of books, short stories, um, nonfiction, uh, nonfiction, and a lot, of, a lot of the stuff that he wrote, though, was published after his death. Uh, he wrote the book uh, McTeague, A Story of San Francisco, I believe it is called, uh, which is interesting because uh, it was later turned into both an opera and a movie, an eight-hour long movie. And uh, just something interesting that I happen to know is that the movie was like cut down by the studio, uh, which angered the director because he he was like, I it needs to be eight hours long in order for you to understand like what happens throughout this entire story and the people who've seen the eight hour cut were like oh this is the greatest movie ever made uh but unfortunately um uh that's it's never seen the light of day the most anyone's ever seen is the four hour cut that amc did in like or was it tmc one of them did in uh in like the late 90s so um, that's just a, a, a side note. Uh, but yeah, um, uh, Frank Norris wrote, um, uh, a great deal. And, um, he was known as a bit of a naturalist, but also known, uh, to be somewhat anti-Semitic and sexist and, and possibly racist in his literature. I didn't find any anti-Semitism or, uh, racism in this book, but there might be some sexism going on. So I can, I can definitely see it, unfortunately. And one thing that he's known for is is the his um his the power of wheat or the story of wheat trilogy, which includes this book. Uh, first, um, I picked this out randomly from my library, so I didn't know any of this going in. Um, the octopus, a story of California, the pit, a story of Chicago, and then uh, the the wolf, the the story of the old country, which is supposed to tell the story of uh, of. Uh, a shipment of wheat going from various places from you know the the fields where it's growing in California to the um, to the uh, uh, what what is it uh, to the wheat pits of Chicago where they sell it and and ship it all elsewhere and and bet on wheat futures and whatnot and then the uh, the pit or uh, the wolf was supposed to take place during a famine in Europe uh, and focus on how uh, how people get their wheat from America and stuff like that. Unfortunately, um, Frank Norris died before he could complete the third book. Uh, but I am still very interested in reading the next, uh, the next story in the series, uh, The Pit, just because um, this one was pretty good. It has its flaws, and I'll get to that later. Uh, but I, I definitely enjoyed that. And so I've been rambling on for about four minutes now. So let's get uh, to the story at hand. I will do a summary, a little bit of analysis, and we will move on from there. So the octopus focuses on California ranchers in the San Joaquin Valley, uh, dealing with a manipulative road, railroad industry in about the 1880s. This is sort of based on a true story, um, as there were other farmers dealing with the with the railroad at the time, uh, who um, who you know struggled a great deal. Uh, the railroad industry uh, is sort of led, um, not really led, but their representative in, in the San Joaquin Valley is S. Bearman, a man noted noted to be very ruthless and uh, and cruel, um, uh, especially in his interactions with the uh, with the rail uh, with the with the ranchers. 
And so we get at the start of the story, we get an introduction to pretty much everyone in a very good chapter where the character of Presley is walking through the San Joaquin Valley, uh, talking with the various ranchers, uh, as well as the, uh, the, the various people who live in the valley. And you get a real feel for what's going on in the, in the valley and who these people are, uh, which I think is, is pretty great. Magnus Derrick shows up on a train. He's also known as the governor. He's a former politician, but now he's a rancher. And so he's really trying to advocate for the other ranchers in order to uh, make sure that they are, are treated fairly by the railroad. However, at the at the very beginning of the story, the, uh, the ranchers have lost a rate hike court case where it costs so much money to ship the uh the wheat from the valley to elsewhere and the uh the railroad has been charging more and more as time has gone on and the ranchers don't believe this is fair uh but they they they, be, they begin to get frustrated with the railroad's power because they're able to buy judges and rig things in their favor and affect uh legislation and policy in california and in Washington, and so they, they they begin to wonder how they're they're supposed to overcome the the railroad if, if this is going to keep happening, and so they plan to form a railroad commission, uh, a league essentially, and get one of their men, uh, Magnus's son Lyman, elected to the to the board in order to eventually lower the the railroad rate. So a very complicated scheme uh, and they even have to engage in some bribery and, and a little bit of corruption to make it happen um, as they, they want the other other people on the railroad commission board to, to go along with them. At the same time you get a bunch of side stories that are happening here. Uh, one character named Vonami uh, is dealing with the loss of his wife not too long ago and um, he's dealing with a lot of grief trying to better understand uh, that relationship and also seemingly willing her back into existence doesn't quite make sense to me it's one of the the uh, the issues that I have with the story and then another uh, story follows Buck Annixter uh, and who is one of the ranchers and he uh, he falls in love with one of his ranch hands Hilma and although it's very clear that she doesn't want to be in this relationship he sort of just wills it makes it happen and they fall in love and and have a great time until the the end of the story once again it is lyman who is put on the uh railroad board through sketchy means um at the same time the uh the the railroad attempts to sell the land that the farmers are on back to them because they're they're currently sort of renting it from the railroad uh, but they have made an agreement when they first settled on the land a long time ago to eventually sell it back to the ranchers at a at a discounted rate and there was that promise but unfortunately the uh, the railroad uh, uh, kind of cheats them on the deal, saying that the farmers made it increase in value, although the ranch, uh, the railroad previously agreed not to uh, not to you know up the value of the land if the farmers did did any improvements, and so the um, so the farmers end up losing a lawsuit to get the land back to the original value, and then the railroad begins uh, selling the land to dummy to dummy dummy buyers, essentially um, preventing the farmers from having a chance to sue in the future uh, because it won't look like they, they own the land any longer. Uh, uh, then there, we're also introduced to the character of Dyke, who used to work for the railroad and was very loyal, including during strikes. But he got fired by the railroad, but he, and he didn't really take uh, too much offense to it, he just thought that was how business went. And he, um, he decides to try his hand at selling hops. Uh, by farming uh, that sort of crop. Uh, and he's promised one rate by the railroad, but when he goes to sell his hops the next year, they it turns out they're selling it at a, at a higher rate. Uh, and since he's already made a deal to sell those hops um, somewhere else, like it, it financially ruins him because he no longer has a way to sell um, w by making a profit and he's already indebted to the to the railroad's bank system too so it seems like they're going to take away the, his home as well as uh, just ruining uh, ruining him running him out of business um, and so what he does is he robs a train in order to uh, make ends meet uh, but the the railroad and the the, the marshals nearby um, round up a posse and he's eventually caught and sent away for life 
Eventually, Ly Ly Lyman returns back to the ranchers and their league and reveals that he was able to get lower deals throughout California. But what's noticeable is that in the San Joaquin Valley, they weren't able to get lower rates for uh, for shipping, which uh, a lot of the league suggests, like, did the railroad get to you, Lyman? Uh, and eventually it is revealed that Lyman was... Uh, was sort of under the thumb of the railroad the whole time. They knew the league was was going to reach out to him, so they bought him beforehand and promised him the governorship since he has political aspirations. And even Magnus Derrick is is um, in addition to losing his son, he loses his reputation as Genslinger, um, the the operator of a of a newspaper that's owned by the railroad, um, blackmails him and then eventually sells him out um, down the road. Uh, the railroad then starts to claim the ranches, um, as there's pretty much no one left to defend them at this point. And in the process, um, uh, a, a sort of um, a misunderstanding happens, which result in a shootout between the railroad's people and the ranchers, and a great majority of the characters die, including Magnus's other son, Heron. So in addition to losing a son, he also um, is sort of betrayed by another. And so Magnus Derrick is pretty much ruined at this point and ends up having to seek out a job from the railroad, sort of rep uh, representing S. Behrman's uh, and the railroad's victory over the league in, in total. And so you have total railroad control, which S. Behrman is happy about uh, as they are now in control of the ranches and making additional money. Um, and this ends up angering Presley, who is just like, I'm done with this. I, I can't stand to watch as you, as you ruined the place that I loved once. And he ends up leaving um, for India um, as, as they are doing their own struggle with famine and, and wheat and something like that. And so as the story ends, S. Behrman uh, sort of falls into a grain elevator and gets drowned out by wheat uh, in, a, in a very ironic death and much deserved death. I hate this character so much. And um, Frank Norris notes that the struggle goes on and he urges the reader to look at the bigger picture. Although the, uh, there was a conflict between the ranchers and the uh, the railroad here, it was very small and he urges you to look at the bigger picture and what's happening with the wheat and the struggle between the, um, those who have power and those who do not. So that's, that's where the story ends there. In terms of analysis, there's a lot of good to talk about here and a lot of bad. Uh, one thing that's worth talking about right off the bat is this conflict between the railroad and the ranchers, um, as it's the central, central, like, centerpiece of this entire story and so it's it's obvious that um uh frank norris wants you to see the ranchers as the little guys that they're exploited by the railroad whether it be through the tragedy of dyke who was very loyal to the railroad uh, until he got fired and then he wanted to start his own hops business and the the railroad exploited him in every way that they could charging him high rates for shipping uh, get, uh, being very predatory with the loans that they gave him um, in order to, for him to start his, his farm in the first place, and then pretty much taking everything out from under him, even going so far as to to get him arrested after he, um, after he has nowhere else to turn, and he, he robs a railroad in order to uh, get the last thing that he can back from, uh, I, I guess, the railroad. So it's it's apparent that the the ranchers are the little guys, but I do have to wonder um, how how strong that analogy is uh, as Frank Norris is writing it. Because yes, the ranchers are exploited, but are they truly the little guy in this story? Uh, I, I'd have to argue that it's it's debatable because it really seems like the ranchers are. Um, they, they claim to be for the people, that this is a struggle of the people versus um, the large corporation. And it kind of is, but at the same time, the ranchers frequently say throughout the story that they're only interested in making money. That uh, the reason they're unhappy with the railroad is not because the railroad is taking their livelihood, but it's reducing their profits. And I, I gotta say, if that's the case, then it's really hard to feel for the ranchers at times because again like there's a there's a discrepancy between what Norris is is arguing uh is the case for the ranchers and what's actually 
the case for the ranchers from what I'm seeing in the in the text. So I think that's that's one issue that Norris has here with like I understand that they are the little guys, but um, the writing could have been a little more clear, a little um, a little more solid um, uh, in order to get at that point. But it's also very clear that the the railroad is very oppressive in every way possible. They own pretty much the entire town of Bonneville in this story, where in the San Joaquin Valley, they, they exploit everyone they can. Uh, they charge high rates. They, they own the banks. They own the newspaper, uh, which advocates for them in every possible way. Um, they, own the, uh, they own the politicians. They own the, uh, the, the judges. There, there's no way for the ranchers to win against these, uh, against these, these villains and thieves, essentially. Allow me to read you an interesting quote. They own us, these taskmasters of ours. They own our homes, they own our legislatures. We cannot escape from them. There is no redress. We are told we can defeat them by the ballot box. They own the ballot box. We are told that we must look to the courts for redress. They own the courts. We know them for what they are. Ruffians in politics, ruffians in finance, ruffians in law, ruffians in trade, bribers, swindlers, and tricksters. No outrage too great to daunt them, no petty larceny too small to shame them. Despoiling a government treasury of a million dollars, yet picking the pockets of a farmhand of the price of a loaf of bread. And that that quote doesn't just like get at you. It's, it's part of the reason why I think there's a, a lot of connection here with John Steinbeck. Although this is 30 years before John Steinbeck, so it's very clear that Steinbeck was... Uh, in some regard, influenced by by this book, especially because it takes place in California. But the point of this is that the the ranchers know how much uh, under the thumb of the railroad they are. That the the railroad controls everything. And to make things more interesting, um, uh, um, uh, Frank Norris manages to connect the railroad to a sort of mechanical monster type of imagery. Uh, several times throughout the story, he compares the uh, the railroad to a titanic, like monstrous beast roaming across the landscape, terrorizing and putting fear into the hearts of everyone who sees it. It's, it's sort of an unnatural sort of thing. And um, given that the railroad is man-made, it goes against everything that you might see in nature, even going so far as to, to pollute nature. Uh, so I, I really like how uh, he does get at the the fact that the railroad is is oppressive, uh, but at the same time, one of the one another big issue that uh, Frank Norris has is he plays into a lot of the both sides kind of nonsense uh, that um, that it really seems like uh, like both sides of of the of the aisle here, like the ranchers and the railroad are to blame, and that uh, nobody's hands are are clean. Um, Especially, it says on the back of this, like, the farmers, however, were not completely blameless. And it's like, I don't like that, especially w with where the story is going. Because the, the railroad is oppressive, uh, it, it corrupts everything that it touches, um, and they don't care for the little people. They're even trying to put people into poverty by squeezing every last dime of them. And it's just like, uh, like it seems like Frank Norris is saying, oh, but on the other hand, the, 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 the farmers, they bribe someone. And it's like, in what universe are those two things equivalent? In what world should I feel angry that the, the farmers are, like, are, are engaging in some shady dealings in order to... I don't know. Get a get a foot up. Like if if the world if, if the world has corporations that uh, that have you by by your throat and throttle you and and make things worse for your your life your quality of life, then yeah, of course you're gonna have to do some shady things. And it, this both sides nonsense is is terrible. It's it's something that I've seen. You know, in today's politics, where it's like, oh, like the Nazis are doing bad things, but the LGBT community, like they told the Nazis to shut up and that's just as bad. No, in fact, it is not. And it's like, do you see this here? Like, that's, that's ridiculous. Like, at the same time, I do understand that, like, maybe this is getting at uh, Frank Norris's point, that none of this matters in the, in the small view. In the larger view, uh, you can see the, the power that wheat is playing and how it, um, the, the profits and the, the, um, 
the desire for for success drives these people to uh, you know engage in these shady tactics and and uh, oppress others and perhaps in the larger view like we, we should think about fixing society so that we don't live in a in a system where this is allowed to to occur and this is what things get to Another thing we're talking about with this story is the power of wheat. Wheat, wheat is written by, uh, by Frank Norris as a titanic force of nature. Allow me to read you a quote from this. The winter brownness of the ground was overlaid with a little shimmer of green. The promise of the sowing was being fulfilled. The earth, the loyal mother, who never failed, who never disappointed, was keeping her faith again. Once more, the strength of nations was renewed. Once more, the force of the world was revivified. Once more, the titan, benignant, calm, stirred and woke, and the morning abrupted, uh, abruptly blazed into glory upon the spectacle of a man whose heart leaped exuberant with the love of a woman. And uh, it just it just goes on. Like at, at various points in the story, he describes the wheat in this way, which comes at a contrast to how he describes the railroad. Whereas the railroad is, brings death and, and poverty, the wheat brings life and joy and and power uh, and uh, it's he also you know this gives a shine to the ranchers in the story because if the wheat is this titanic force of nature then the people who master the wheat or you know the people who attempt to master the wheat at least uh, that's um, those people must be you know pretty sturdy pretty pretty amazing people and um, that that must be what the ranchers are they are they are uh, majestic you know gods of sorts who are capable of of growing growing and harvesting this this um, this godly plant or something like that. And so it, uh, it also seems like wheat is the true king in this story. Like there are people who do claim mastery over it, uh, especially at the end of the story. Uh, S. Behrman is like, I am the master of wheat. I control everything now. Ha ha ha. Um, and then he falls into the wheat elevator and he suffocates and dies. Uh, thus showing that he, you know, he was a bit arrogant and he should not have believed that he was that he held uh, dominion over uh, this this uh, this food that grew out of the ground. Another interesting thing to note about this story is the amount of detail that uh, Frank Norris goes into. It is an extreme amount of detail. It kind of seems like it's parodying um, uh, what I've read from uh, from John Steinbeck. Although again, be this came before Steinbeck. And I just think the amount of detail is just a tiny bit too much. Much like with House of Leaves, um, uh, with Mark Z. Danielewski, Frank Norris could have done just a little bit less, and it would have made the story flow more smoothly, and uh, would have, um, I don't know, it, it would have gotten less bogged down with the details. He could have worked on honing his message a little bit more instead of adding unnecessary detail at times and the, the last thing I'll say is that um, the ending kind of meanders with the story where you have the shootout between the railroad and the uh, the ranchers and then the story just kind of just drones on for a little bit uh, showing everything getting progressively worse for everyone and it, it feels like um, like a sort of uh, conclusion that never really ends and I, I think a big problem with that is again Frank Norris was confused with his own messaging and so as a result he doesn't quite know how to get to the ending that he wants and so uh, I feel like that's a, uh, a more a larger problem with the story that um, prevents it from truly hitting all the right notes. Anyway those are my thoughts on The Octopus A Story of California by Frank Norris. I would say it's a good story a, a very entertaining and and well-written story um, with the, the main problem being the confusing messaging, the, the slight sexism that takes place in the story, the, 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 the over amount of detail, and um, just the, the weird writing at times that, that, that just causes the story to, to meander at various points. Like, I, I definitely enjoyed it, but I, I find it hard to say I recommend it or not, because it's 421 pages. Uh, which is a significant investment for anybody. And I feel like if I say I recommend it, then someone's going to go out there and read it and be like, oh, why did I read this? This is bad. Um, so I feel like 
I should qualify. Like, I think you should read it. Like, this is an interesting story that is, uh, if you're a fan of Steinbeck in particular, you can see the influences there. But you have to know what you're getting into. Uh, and this is a very bizarre, bizarre, bizarre story written by a very bizarre man. And I, I do think you should, you know, you, there should be a caveat to whether or not I recommend this. I just, I just feel the need to stress that so you don't sink time into a story that might not deliver in the end. Um, I feel like I should say this, uh, like I said, the same thing about uh, Stoner by John Williams, a amazing book in my opinion, but it's a very big time investment and it, it doesn't land with everyone. So it's hard to, you know, fully recommend that kind of work for somebody. Um, but if you if you want to say something about my review um, or you've read this before, let me know in the comments below. I would love to hear from you. Let's have a discussion about the octopus. Otherwise, don't don't uh, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. So I guess more people can learn about Frank Norris. And until then, I wish you the best of luck in your weird and oppressed travels. Farewell.